eventually they got rid of it because the the good thing they've done with Wheel of Fortune and all the time that's helped it is they constantly do surveys of their audience. What do you like? What do you don't like? What can be approved? I think everyone was telling them there, you know, this shopping bit just drives the show to a crawl. And that is our guest, Wesley Hyatt. He's the author of the new book, I'd Like to Buy a Vowel, Spinning 50 Years of Wheel of Fortune. And last time we're talking about Fred Silverman, who had had success at both CBS and ABC. And by the late 70s to early 80s, he was at NBC, where his King Midas touch was completely in reverse. And it was affecting Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, I remember Fred Silverman was made fun of in the spring of 1980 on NBC's Saturday Night Live uh, Mm -hmm. during Weekend Update by Al Franken doing the sketch that was called The Limo for That Lamo. And uh, there's a book about Saturday Night Live. I forget who the authors were, but it was about Saturday Night's first 10 years. And um, Franken held this uh, chart up that said, okay, here's the top 10 shows in prime time. Here's the shows. Here's the networks. Let's look at the networks. You got some A's. You got some B's. You got some C's. You got some S's. No N's. Okay, Gary Coleman, he deserves a limo. He's got one of the top shows. But how come they don't have a – how come they have a limo for that limo, Fred Silverman, but not for me, <laughs> Al Franken? And if you want to get a limo for me, Al Franken, they keep on flashing his name on the screen. Right to get Al Franken a limo, care of Fred Silverman, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, New York, New York. And yeah. um, they, they were just like, you know, people – everybody loved him. But then that Monday – Lauren Michaels got a call from uh, Silverman demanding that he fire Al Franken. And and <laughs> Michael said, no way, I'm not firing Al Franken. So for like three months, they were just at complete odds with one another. And then finally, Michaels had enough and quit Saturday night along with just about everybody there, with mm-hmm. the exception of a few writers and associate pr- producer Gene Dumanian, who took over as executive producer. Mm-hmm. But, um, man, it was like – to just to think that Lorne Michaels quit because of that. I mean, that was that to me showed uh, like loyalty. I wish he had done the yeah. same thing when when uh, the head of NBC, eighteen years later, demanded that he fire uh, Norm Macdonald for making too much fun of of O.J. Simpson. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, that <laughs> yeah. didn't happen. That's to me when when Saturday Night Jumped the Shark was when uh, Lorne Michaels wouldn't stand oh. up and say, "No, I'm not going to fire Norm Macdonald for making fun of O.J. Simpson." But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's another story right there. It's it's interesting that you mentioned the NBC late night. I didn't put it in the book somewhat intentionally. Um, Dick Ebersol, who was in charge of late night at NBC during the 70s there, uh, he married Susan Stafford. That's right. Um, they had a quick relationship, you know, a whirlwind romance, and probably should have, you know, not rushed into marriage, as it turned out. It, it ended up being... Um, uh, it, they didn't have it dissolved. It was um, annulled. Mm. So with that in mind, he's got his autobiography came out about a year or two ago, and he doesn't mention her at all, I guess because he, since it's considered that the marriage never happened, he presents like he doesn't need to mention her. So he just talks about marrying suits in St. James, and you you get the impression like, oh, that was his first and only wife, and that's not the case. And so I'm like, okay, well, then I'll treat you the same way and not include you in my book. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> um, I, I did mention I did mention some in the book. I did mention about when Chuck was married to Joanne Paflug, only mm-hmm. because she was a bigger night name at the time uh, when he was doing Wheel of Fortune because of her TV show appearances. And there was one winner on the show, uh, a big winner of the sweepstakes they had in 76. And um, I asked her, you know, how was your experience on the show? And she said, well, you've seen the pictures of me as a winner. I'm like, yeah, I have. And she's like, who do you think I look like? I went, you mean Joanne Paflug? She said, yep, that's what everybody told me. I said, you look a lot like her. I was like, okay, say no more then. So, yeah. And I put in the book a comparison of a picture of her and then a picture of uh, Joanne when she was on the show with Chuck during a, a Christmas episode, you know, mm. so you can kind of see the resemblance. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I remember seeing that somewhere. Um, either you posted on Facebook or somebody did. Uh, I was like, wow, kind of like um, Peter Marshall in his book, Backstage with the Original Hollywood Square, 
uh, produced a picture of himself with Wally Cox on one side and then a, a Wally Cox lookalike on the other side. And yeah. I still am trying to figure out which one was actually Wally Cox. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. It was incredible there, you know. It was um, It was really I, – I, I enjoyed talking to her um, – yeah, because I like that was one of the one I was able to talk to some of the winners going down all the way to the seventies. You know, which wow. was impressive to me. Yeah, and there's some member of the alumni club who are going back all the way to the seventies, and you know, it's kind of interesting for them because even though they could compete up to three days during that time, you know, a lot of the and they had a lot of pri- they had to buy prizes. Mm-hmm. That was the period when you had to go shopping afterward, so. They would pick out whatever they could afford from what they, you know, it was listed there and telling them how how much money they had and what amounts could buy what there. And uh, I heard from M.G. Kelly, who was a substitute announcer for the show in the late 80s. I said, how hard was it doing the shopping thing? He was like, oh, my gosh. There would be times when, you know, they'd have like 10 or 15 prizes on that thing for them to go shopping, and the person would be able to win all 10 or 15, and he'd have to read the copy for each one of them, you know. <laughs> so the copy is, you know, what I like. It's They time it to be like maybe 8 to 10 seconds. So that's, what, 100 seconds or so, which on television is an eternity, oh, you yeah. know. And and having to announce them, oh, and da-da-da-da-da, and here's the da-da-da, da-da-da-da, you know. <laughs> it it t- tests your patience, you know. And eventually they got rid of it because – the, the good thing they've done with Wheel of Fortune all the time that's helped it is they constantly do surveys of their audience. What do you like? What do you don't like? What can be approved? And um, I think everyone was telling them there, you know, this shopping bit just drives the show to a crawl. And it, it, I've seen episodes in the 80s where a person would win and then they'd be like, oh, we got to take a commercial, but when you come back, we're going to go shopping with her. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> it was better when they said, okay, here's the prizes you selected, and just kind of like fast forwarded. Because sometimes the contestant would be like, uh, for, um, let's see, uh, for, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what they hated when they had contestants who were, who were uncertain what to get or didn't know what to get. Um, and then they had some people, you didn't have to necessarily go shopping there, you could put it on account. That's right. And get that money, but you know, if you landed on bankrupt at any round afterward, it would be out of there. And there was one guy in '78 who did it, and just lost pretty much everything he won during that game. I was like, "Oh my oh, gosh!" Man. But um, that was the risk you took at the time. Oh you know? yeah. So. Now these contestants that you uh, that you interviewed as part mm-hmm. of the alumni. Um, what percentage have the actual episodes that they appeared on? Because pretty much the Woolery episodes, with the exception of ones that have been taped off of WNBC TV from 1979 to 1980, have been lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, what percentage have them? Because I remember talking with um, one uh, wheel uh, contestant in particular, and uh, she was on there in 1980. In fact, she was also on Chain Reaction in 1980. Um, mm-hmm. Arlene Pickerel is her name. And yep. uh, she won, I think, a Mazda GLC as far as the episode was concerned. She says she has the tape but doesn't have the format to convert it in. What percentage actually had their actual episodes? Uh, a good amount actually have an episode or had an episode that they had because that was in the late 70s. There were, was the DVD, the, the not DVD, the VHS explosion. And some of them were wise enough to tell their family, hey, take me on there. I'm going to be on the show and was able to get copies that way. Um, nowadays, contestants can write to Sony and get a copy of their, their episode. I think they pay like a $75 fee for a DVD cut of it, mm-hmm. but um, they're able to do that way. Yeah, back in the, like you said, back in the 70s, it was rare to get an episode of the show, you know, anytime, any way that you could. I was lucky enough to get, when they did a a bad foray in late 75, early 76, when they tried to go for an hour and it didn't work well and it only lasted seven weeks, I was able to get an audio copy of that from Mm. a collector that was out there. But, yeah, there's even even when I looked at um, Paley Center, 
and uh, Library of Congress, there are very few episodes of Wheel of Fortune available before 79, really, mm. you know, and they were getting things together. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think I, I've heard there may be a few private collections, but yeah, there's not that much out there because as uh, you and probably your many of your listeners know, um, the practice at the time was to tape over the um, shows themselves because it was considered expensive to use the videotape and archive it and keep it that way. And they're like, who wants to see this again? We've already run it once. There's no need to. So they would just tape over it for a lot of that time. And that's why we have most game shows, especially daytime game shows, we're missing copies of them uh, until the 80s, unfortunately. Yeah. You know? It's interesting because there's different people that are suddenly producing tapes. Like um, Rick Mandel was a contestant on Wheel of Fortune in 1976. He was a champion. I think he was a three-day champion. Yep. Then he was part of the 1976 uh, Tournament of Champions. I know Rick because yep. he was my pastor when I was a little kid. And oh, wow. uh, Yeah. <laughs> and he was uh, on Wheel of Fortune in 76. Then in 1984, he along with the then uh, senior pastor of the church that he's still the pastor of, along with the youth pastor, were on Hot Potato together as preachers. They won about $4,500. Then three years after that, he was again with Chuck Willery re- reunited on Scrabble where he won about fourteen or $18,000. He got uh-huh. the bonus sprint the first time he became champion. And then in uh, the 2000s, he was a contestant on Lingo. And when he was on Lingo, Chuck Willery pointed out, you know, Rick, you've been on like three of my game shows now. It's like in Rick went in his DJ voice. He used to be a DJ before he was a pastor. He's like, well, Chuck, yeah, I was on Wheel of Fortune in 1976. Then in the 1980s, I was on Scrabble. In the 1990s, since I've been happily married for many, many years, I couldn't go on the dating game. But now I'm glad to be here on Lingo. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's wild. Yeah, I, was, I wanted to try and get a, a hold of him, but I just couldn't. I had all these different things. Going down, there was I. I had a spreadsheet of about a hundred different people I was trying to track down. Um, in fact, for the thing, there were a couple of uh, people I were trying to contact that were uh, friends of Lynn Bolin. I never got a hold of them, and, and some others that were associated with Merv over the years. Um, but I think I've got a pretty good representation of you know, people who've been on the show and gotten them, and uh, and a good you know sampling of the ones who are no longer with us, what they said in interviews, you know? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I wish I had known about your book because I would have given you Rick's contact, at least on <laughs> Facebook, but uh, <laughs> hindsight's oh, twenty well. twenty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At least I was able to help you out with the Betty White book with uh, Mark Maxwell Smith to talk about uh, her yes. hosting the pilot to uh, Hollywood's Talking, which actually my dad was a contestant on that show. Um, wow. He lost the game and won $25 worth of Brock's candy. However, it was summertime, and they were afraid it was going to melt, so they gave him 25 bucks in cash instead, which bummed my mom because my parents being from Chicago, and at the time, Brock's was was uh, headquartered there. She so badly wanted $25 worth of Brock's candy. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's another show that, Again, was a victim of the uh, the tape erasing. There is a company out there called uh, it's not for profits called Obsolete Video Services. Um, I'm not sure sure if you've have heard of them before, but they've been uh, recycling or or getting old tapes. A lot of them recorded off LA TV stations. I've um, seen those, yes. And one of the uh, mostly it's been news and uh, TV talk show programs, but. Uh, one of the discoveries they did make was of the new treasure hunt with uh, Jeff Edwards. Mm-hmm. And um, then uh, they said they've unfortunately been asked by uh, some companies not to broadcast some of the stuff they uh, presented on YouTube. They had to take it down, uh, which is a bummer. Uh-huh. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i wondering because I remember I think Adam Neve told me this, that somebody in the Midwest beginning in the early 70s until the early 80s, started recording on these, you know, big, bulky VCRs pretty much round the clock, the the TV stations, and they have all these tapes that are being uh, digitized to kind of bring back 
a bunch of programs, but I'm not sure what mm-hmm. the uh, the status is of that. I don't know if you've heard about about that or not, but that would be really cool. Yeah. As I said, you know, I'm constantly surprised at things that keep coming out that we thought we'd never find out, um, you know, never see again. So I wouldn't be surprised. The, the, the challenge that we have nowadays, of course, is that there are far fewer companies holding the rights to these shows. And you know, m- mostly major corporations. And if you, you know, don't do the right thing, they will tell you to take them out or get rid of them. You know, which is the the bad part. You know, which is why I I've held on to my uh, DVDs of anything that I've got. You know, I'm like I don't. You know, there's no guarantee it's going to stay on a streaming service forever. Oh yeah, you know, because on they have so um, yeah, and. and Thankfully, Wheel of Fortune has got a pretty good, you know, solid group of people out there keeping it alive, and they're doing a good job with the show. Plus, there are several groups. There's at least one guy I talked to um, who's got excellent recaps of the shows, so he writes them up and gives them a grade. It's really cute. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that's good. That helps a lot. You know, if there's been stuff I don't have time to watch, I'm like, oh, okay, this is what he said, and it pretty much is goes by what it what happened, you know, has excellent recaps. And what's his website also, by, by chance? That is, <laughs> that's a good question. Let me keep looking. I, I yeah. should know all of that. I think it's, um, Andy Nguyen's website. And, um, if I got it here, cause he was really good to talk to. There's also, um, another website that a lot of them, I think there's a by a vowel is, um, one of the websites. A lot of them refer, refer to, to try and, get things um, to study um, for the show. Yeah, there's biaval.boards.net, which has got a lot of good information there. Um, It's um, Wheel of Fortune with Andy Nguyen, N-G-U-Y-E-N, and it may be, you can find it on Andy in letter N, W-O-F, period, wordpress.com. But just look up World of, Wheel of Fortune, Landing Gwen. He does a great job of um, getting things um, summarized that way. And as I, I mentioned, that uh, by val, val.boards.net has got a wonderful archive of all the puzzles that they've had over the years. So a lot of them have studied that because they have recycled puzzles several times. Mm. You know, some of them like... Uh, I think Niagara Falls has been a big one, you know, for them to do several times. That was a tricky one and, and some others. Um, so, yeah, a lot of contestants say they they refer to those areas. They also, of course, do a lot of crossword puzzles, uh, a lot of things just to keep their minds, you know, active and, ex- you know, trying what to expect and what to see on the show. I got a question. So, I'm curious yeah. about Wheel of Fortune because – I didn't know about the used letter board until many years later. Um, why do they show it to the contestants, but they don't show it to the people at home? I think it might have been a challenge technically to do a lot of that, you know, at the same time for what they had on the screen. Before, you know, we had the TV screens that we have nowadays. You know, it was kind of small and getting it together. And um, honestly, the used letter board was not that was not a big mechanical thing during the early years. It used to be just a person just, you know, showing what letters were available, you know, manually mm. to people. It was nothing there, and it would have been kind of embarrassing if they had that kind of a thing as a chiron on the on the area there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think they do that just now to um, you know uh, as a sense of clarity and and you know convenience. They do, of course. You know, when people, they now show you all the letters they call out on the on the screen there. But, uh, yeah, I think it was just more of a thing of a, you know, the setup that would be hard to have it all on screen and have it look good, you know. Oh, yeah. So. Now, when um, you've worked with, uh, you are on Stu's show with uh, Professor yeah. Steve Beverly, uh, which yeah, is yeah. heard most Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific time at uh, stewsshow.com. That's S-T-U-S show.com. We're talking with Wesley Hyatt, author of the brand new book, I'd Like to Buy a Vowel, 
Spinning 50 Years of Wheel of Fortune, which you can pick up on Amazon.com or some other online sources like Barnes & Noble or your local mom-and-pop bookstore. If if you have one in your neighborhood, please go there and and purchase it there. You can also check it out at BearManorMedia.com. That's B-E-A-R-M-A-N-O-R, BearManorMedia.com. And next time Wesley talks about announcers he got to talk with for the book, as well as remembering the late, great Charlie O'Donnell, who was known back in his days on 1110 Carolay as the Jolly Lean Giant. 